Welcome to the Swim Swim Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. And joining me today, we've got a very special guest. She is <laughs> so many accolades. She's a two-time Olympic champion. She's a five-time world champion. She is a six-time Pan Pacific champion. And she is a seven-time Commonwealth champion. That's just the golds, people. There's so many more medals, but she's she's been a stalwart uh, in backstroke for Australia in the sport for a long, long time. And I'm super excited to sit down and chat with her for a little bit. We've got Emily Seabom today. Emily, how's it going? Yeah, good. Uh, when you put it like that, like I, I don't really hear people uh, say like that. Like whenever I go anywhere, no one's saying that to me. So <laughs> it's quite interesting hearing that because uh, I actually like don't keep up with like what I've done. So like I, I only know my best times. Um, and then I struggle for anything else. You don't when whenever you go for a coffee, they don't say uh, seven time Commonwealth champion Emily Seabom. Your coffee's ready. <laughs> no, they don't. That's Thank surprising. God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's that's actually one thing I wanted to talk to you about, and I'm gonna I'll, so I'll bring it up later. We'll, we'll put a pin in it for now, but it's, it's interesting, you know. Um, how we give titles to these, these certain things or what, what you win. And anyway, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to bring that up in a little bit, but I want to, I want to start with, um, with ISL, uh, because it just finished and, you know, kind of the, the elephant in the room, just from the media perspective was that you were only, you were one of only two Australians to actually go and participate. Um, so can you, can you, before we get into the bubble, can you just take me through the process of getting to the bubble? Yeah, um, it was quite interesting. Obviously, ISL originally was going to be on the Gold Coast in Australia, which would have been amazing, but yes. um, that obviously fell through. Uh, COVID became really uh, extreme and Australia took some really severe measures to keep us safe. Um which obviously have helped us now. Uh, but yeah, so ISL then obviously moved uh, to Budapest. They found a new location. Um, Australia, from my understanding, had a travel ban at that stage, but you could get an exemption from the government to go over um, on cases like needing to go for work and um, seeing family and like really important things. So uh, at first, I mean, Australia said that that was going to be the issue that the government wouldn't approve us to go, which, um, yeah, was kind of like hard. But then I was like, oh, well, I did some like research into it and kind of looked into it. And um, a few other people that were planning to go looked into and said that it only took them 24 hours to kind of get approval from the government to go. Um, so then that kind of became like an easy process and I was like oh sweet then like there's no issue with going um but then they kind of brought in the fact that there was a travel ban and that they weren't happy for us to go over um in case we did get sick in case we got injured while we were over there um and they didn't want to be from my understanding they didn't want to be liable for any um mm -hmm. for any issues that could have arose from getting sick and coming home and then trying to make the Olympic team. And um, that was kind of their reasoning, but they did say that we could send in a letter of um, exemption from them to get an exemption from Swimming Australia to then go over and compete. Um, and being uh, on the team for 14 years, I thought I had like a really good uh, reason as to why I did want to go to ISL. Obviously, I had a terrible year last year and didn't make the team to go to Worlds. Um, and I just felt like I needed that international racing experience to help me gain more confidence back in my go to trials and make that Olympic team to have that experience before I get to the Olympics and I haven't seen people for years. Um, so I thought I had a really good reason, obviously, 
that unfortunately got denied um, and they still said that um, they weren't going to approve that but I could send, you know, more reasoning as to as to why and hopefully that might get approved but I really didn't have any other reason apart from the fact that it was beneficial for me to go um, and I felt like I was going to be safe. Um, they ha- thought that it probably wasn't going to be as safe as it turned out to be. Um, so I obviously, you know, continued to go and I left and um, I did get receive like an email of a sanction, um, which meant that I lost my funding for the time that I left Australia, that I was unable to do camps and um, train with my squad until I um, passed a fitness test when I got home. And then um, I, from my understanding, I get, you know, my funding back as soon as I land in Australia and I do a fitness test. I don't really know what that entails. Um, but I mean, like I've been, I've only been out of the water two weeks and, you know, I swam really well at ISL. So I'm not really sure if like what this fitness test will in, entail, but I mean, I've spoken to, um, the head people at Swimming Australia and they were really happy, um, with my decision to go over. So I was confused as to why I still got sent the sanction, but I think, you know, it's just trying to save them in case I did get sick or I hurt myself overseas and then I couldn't train and make that Olympic team next year. That does seem like a bit of mixed messages. Um, but yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't, can I ask just like, how does that make you feel? Um, I guess like I was like disappointed because I feel like, um, you know, like as you, as you just like said all my, all the things that I've done in my career, I feel like I've done a lot and I don't really like, I'm not, I, I didn't think I was asking too much in going and that I felt safe going. And I, I just feel like, I'm an adult and like I can make a decision as an adult and um, obviously like I've done like since like being over there and coming back I've had almost 12 COVID tests and they've all been negative and I competed really well and I feel like I've got some confidence back in my swimming and like I feel like it's a positive step for me so I mean it's hard when your um, organisation like didn't see the, that there was such a positive to going. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's really cool that you did what was best for you and that you did end up going. And uh, I mean, like you said, you swam really well, had a positive experience, got some confidence back. Tell me about the bubble. You know, you were, you were with energy standard, the defending champs, um, they, they have people from all over the world, yourself included, you know, it's like, what, what's the team like, what was racing that much like, uh, t- tell me about your bubble experience. I actually, I really enjoyed it. Um, I love, um, being on energy standard and I love that there's so many people from all around the world that can, you know, once we got together, it's just kind of like we're a clique, we're a team, we all support each other, we all have fun with each other. Like, you know, we had a team room in Budapest and we'd go down there and play Mario Kart and play games together. So um, I really loved the experience. I loved being over there. It it was hard, though, um, racing that first week and then we kind of had, like, a two-week break. That was probably the hardest period because it was, like, we couldn't really do anything apart from train. And I was like, Oh, like at that stage, I was like, Oh, if I'm just training, like, why am I here? But then, you know, as soon as that racing picked up again, it was just like, boom, boom, boom. And it was, and then it was like over before I knew it. And I was like, Oh God, like, and now I'm trying to like relive the last six weeks. I, I think that was one of the funnest things for like, from a media perspective, just to kind of follow is all the team's different schedules and who was racing when and who had that off week. Um, because I know I talked to James Gibson, your head coach at the kind of towards the beginning. 
um, after that first match. And he, you know, he had mentioned like, yeah, we have like 10 days off and then it's like two on, two off, two on, two off, um, which is, which was wild. How do you feel once, once your racing got kicked in, um, how do you feel like you reacted to all that back-to-back racing? Yeah, well, I've done a, a fair few of the World Cup clusters before, so I kind of took it as a bit like that. Um, you know, like when we do those World Cups, we race for those two days, then we have a travel day, a rest day, and then we race again. So, you know, I spoke to a few people that had done World Cups before and they were like, oh, it's fine. Like it's just like doing World Cups, except you don't have to travel anywhere, so you get more rest. So. I was like, yeah, that's fine. And like, it's a two hour session. It goes so quick and, you know, it's just kind of fun to be out there and racing for a team and, um, you know, screaming in the box when you're done and, you know, wearing that mask in the end, in the final, I was just like pulling it down to scream and then pulling it back up. <laughs> um, was, was there a highlight for you throughout this six week season? Um, did you, do you have any top moments that really stick out for you? Uh, uh, I think it was in that week two that we were there uh, the, after the first uh, meet that we did that first weekend after that we were all like so bored we were just like had we're struggling for things to do and we actually did like a team games night like it was like trivia mixed with like a few games and I feel like that was just like a really good experience because I feel like after we did that we were, we kind of like really bonded with each other and we had like something to laugh about it that we were all in that same situation. So we could all laugh to each other about it. So I feel like that was a really good highlight because uh, we just got to have fun and relax and, and we weren't really focusing on the competition to come. Like we knew that we were going to have like back to back racing and it was going to be intense. But at that moment, we could just like hang out and be friends. Yeah. I mean, that's, that sounds like a really, really nice moment. And I mean, game games, trivia, it's, it's especially, <laughs> especially after spending so much time alone, you know, generally or without as many people as normal in this, in this quarantine era, that sounds really cool. Did on, on energy standard, um, were there people that you, what did training look like? Did you have people you would reg- routinely train with in the bubble? Um, I did a lot of sessions uh, with Sarah. Um, I did a couple with Chad um, and then a few that um, my coach, Michael Boll, had sent through as well, which no one wanted to do with me because some were quite hard. I did try to convince Matt Grievous to do some with me, but he said that his uh, threshold level wasn't as good as mine. (laughs) But anyway, um, yeah, I trained a bit with Sarah, which was quite fun. Um, I think me and Sarah have a really um, similar training uh, environment. I think that we do similar things and we're able to push our bodies um, to, to around the same level. Obviously, she can swim faster than I can in freestyle, but I think my backstroke is like a similar level as what her freestyle would be. So I think we really had a good environment to train with each other and really push each other. Nice. I mean, that's, again, that's one of the coolest parts about ISL, right? Is that you, it brings these people together and people that normally wouldn't get the chance to train with each other and whatnot, um, you know, you get to get to swim with them and you get to meet them and be friends with them, which is, which is super cool. A hundred percent. Um, so let's, it sounds like you had, you had a very positive bubble experience, Let's take it back a little further. Um, you know, I think lockdown in the U S at least started maybe mid March. I think for Australia, it started around then as well, maybe a bit after, but, um, you know, what did those last six months look like for you in terms of, were you able to train? Were you super isolated? Um, you know, what, what, did, what did that look like? Maybe mid March as well or early March. And we basically were out of the pool until uh I think it was like late June that we uh were allowed to go back and train at first it was like a little bit like it was only like one session a day we only had a couple of hours here and there um before we could actually really train properly 
Um, and obviously because we'd had so long off, uh, Bowley didn't really want us to like go back up to what we were doing before we left because obviously before we left, we were training really hard. We had our trials in, obviously we ha- were going to have our trials in June. So we were at like peak training. It was super intense. So to kind of go straight to nothing, it was quite weird. And uh, there were like a few, uh, like I would say I was for a while, I was going, some nights I would cry and be like, oh, this is it. Like uh, I might as well retire. Like, I had it set in my mind that 2020 was going to be my last year and that I wasn't going to swim on from that. And then this happened and I was just kind of a little lost at first and I was just like, oh, like, what's the point? Like, why? Like, I'm going to be 29 then by the time the Olympics rolls around. Like, I'm going to be so old. Like, I'm not going to be able to do it. Like, I struggle now, like, getting super tired and super fatigued and I was like, I'm not going to be able to make it. And I would cry and cry, like like some nights I would just cry before going to bed because I'm like, oh, this is such a waste, like if I'm going to retire on this. And and then I don't know what happened, but something just hit me and I kind of just started running and not worrying about swimming at all. I kind of just was like, oh, well, like at first, like I was trying to swim in my own pool, like on a stretch cord, but then I just was getting so bored with that. I was like, what's the point? I'd go to the beach and I'd swim you know 4k in the ocean but then I was like what am I training for because I can't get back in the pool I can't race like what's the point so I just kind of was just like left that and I just started running um and just like every day I just noticed that I would want to push myself like a little bit more like I would start you know I started at like 4k and then got up I was like doing 5k and then I was like all right let's do 5k under a time and then from that it was kind of like all right I've done 5k like let's go a little bit more see how much I can do and then I started getting up to like 8k's and then I was like I reckon I could do 10k I'd never never done 10k straight running before and I was like all right I'll do it and then I did it and then I was like all right let's go 10k under an hour and then I, I under yeah under the hour and I was like all right And then once I did that, I was like, all right, one day I just woke up and I was like, I want to do 15K. I want to see if I can do 15K. And I did 15K and I did it in like an hour and 34 minutes or something. Like it was all right, like pretty good for a swimmer. And then I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm done. Like if I've got that determination for doing something that I don't normally do, like imagine what I can do if I put my mind to swimming. And then the pools kind of reopened again and I, it was, I don't know, like, it was just like, I was just different. And I, and I, I don't know what it was, but yeah, just halfway through COVID, I just kind of snapped. And I just realized that, nah, I'm not done yet. This, this is very cinematic. Sounds like a movie. Uh, I mean, I can like, I'm, I'm seeing the scenes in my head as, as you describe them. Um, that's, that's really cool. Um, it's so one question I have is while you were running in this period, while you were running and kind of building up to this 15 K, what, how are you spending your time at other, other than working out? <laughs> Uh, I wasn't really doing a lot. I was probably like, because normally when I train on the coast, um, my place is in Brisbane. I spend half my time on the coast, half my time in Brisbane. Um, And I was, you know, at home for the longest period I've ever been home since I was 14. Like being able to stay home for, for two, three months at a time. Like I've never had that before. So I, I was kind of just like playing around with little things and, um, yeah, I wasn't really doing like anything exciting. I mean, the running was as exciting as it got. Um, Obviously I have a horse, so I was still horse riding as well. So I was kind of, yeah, I was just like, I feel like I was just working out 24 uh, seven. I totally, I think I, I think I knew you were interested in horses. I totally, I didn't know you had a horse that what kind of a workout is, I mean, is, is riding a horse, cardio or is that just 
I mean, it, it just sounds mentally so refreshing. I mean, um, like I, I get, if I don't ride for a really long time, um, I get the sorest like legs, like in, it's a very big inner thigh workout. Um, I ride bareback, um, without a saddle. Um, and I ride, uh, without technically without a bit, um, just like a nose strap instead of like being too intense with the bit in the mouth, um, which is like less control of the horse, but it's more um, rider horse, like uh, understanding. Um, So we kind of like, we do a lot of trail riding. I used to do a lot of jumping, but then he had a leg injury that affected his shoulder. So we are not really safe to jump anymore. Um, but a lot of kind of like just flat work, working on transitioning from like a walk to a trot, a trot to a canter. And then kind of we just kind of have fun and just enjoy it. Most of the time uh, he loves just like going out and just running full pelt at things. So we do a lot of that. <laughs> so what I'm what I'm hearing is the horse whisperer. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Um, so that, that's, that's super cool. And so you have, you have this moment where you're like, I'm not done. Uh, and then you get back to the pools and what, I mean, do you feel like you came back to the pool with a new perspective? Was, was training different for you? Did you want to try new things or, you know, what, what happened when you got back into the swing of training in, you know, June, July, August? Yeah, I think when I got back, I just felt uh, obviously it was hard because at first, like, there was no competition, there was nothing coming up. And, like, it was still a bit like, oh, well, like, why am I back in the pool so early if nothing's coming? And then kind of this ISL coming, it came up. And it was just like a godsend because I knew that I really wanted to hit that, that I wanted to work towards that. And I think I came back, like, like mentally stronger like it was nice for me to have so long out of the pool um like in the amount of time that I've been on the team like the longest I've had off at a time is maybe like I think I took two months off after London 2012 and that was that's been my longest break since then so it was crazy to think that I hadn't been out of the water for so long and I just felt like so refreshed and like mentally I knew what I wanted like I had like a clearer understanding of the goal that I was trying to achieve and I think when I was just training constantly uh, leading up to that and I kind of was just seeing Tokyo as like oh when, once Tokyo is done I'm done like it doesn't matter what happens but I think now coming back I'm like well it does matter what I do and I really want to do a good job of it so do you think you will still be done after Tokyo or is that more of an open-ended thing now? Well, I think with this ISL, there's, there's more interest to, um, yeah, like ISL gave me something, uh, to really work towards. It gave me a goal and, um, like ISL, it's fun. It's exciting. And, it's not as intense as an Olympic cycle can be. So, so what I'm hearing is that, you know, ISL could, could, which I think is part of the reason, you know, or a goal of ISL at least is it could keep you in the sport for longer because, you know, you can do ISL for a year or two years or three, you know, it's not that four year commitment. Yeah, it is. It's kind of just like a fun Like I find it really fun um, being on a team with people that I guess like you see succeed and and do really well and you kind of just like want to almost like leech on that and and just have so much fun and enjoyment with it because that ISL, you're doing it for the team. It's not an individual thing. You're really trying to get as many points as you can for your team and it just, yeah, it's really, really fun. Yeah. 
So, so it sounds like you're in a, in a, in a solid place. Now you're coming off the bubble. Your, <laughs> your vigor is renewed, which is super cool. And so, um, so I want to shift gears a little and, and talk about, again, you've been in the sport for so long. One of my favorite statistics about you is that we're the same age. We're both 28. <laughs> um, but, but you've been swimming at an elite level since you were 14. Uh, I mean, at least, right. You've been on the Australian national team since you were 14, right? Yeah. Which is, I mean, you make your first national team that young. What, what is, <laughs> what is that like? Um, just, just being a kid, but I, I mean, being a, at the top of the top. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know it was going to happen that early on um obviously like I was a good junior swimmer as well I think I made my first uh Australian junior team at like 11 so I was very young too um and then the only reason that I made the team in 2007 was our trials that year were in 2006 because Worlds was obviously in March um in 2007 And the trials were in Brisbane, which is where I lived, where I trained. Um, And my coach was just like, I think I made the qualifying time. So he's like, oh, well, it's just here. Like, we might as well just do it. And, like, we obviously didn't have to fly anywhere. There was no, um, like, hotel needed. We could just drive to the pool. And, you know, I swam the heat, made it through, um, I think, swam the semi and then made it through, I think, in, like, lane four or lane five. Um, and I was, I remember like before the finals, I was just like to my coach, do you think I'll make the team? Like I had no idea. And I was just like, oh, maybe I could. That was like the kind of like the first thing where I was like, oh, I think I could do this. And then, um, I ended up dead heating to win. And I was just like, at that stage, I just had no idea the impact, uh, swimming had on my life. I think before then everything I did was just kind of like, Oh, whatever. I'll just give it a go type thing. And ever since then, it's just kind of been like an amazing roller coaster. Like to think of the fact that I've been on the team since I was 14. Um, I remember telling a few people that at ISL, like, um, because Sarah has been on the team for just as long. I think she was a bit younger when she made the, um, her national team so we were kind of talking about it and then one of the girls on the team was like oh my god you're so old and I was like no (laughs) I was like no I'm not that old and I think like that's when it hit me I was like I remember when I was 14 on the team and I looked at people my age now and I go wow they're so old and they're still doing it and that's me now and I like get out of it because I'm like I'm like, oh my God, I'm that old person on the team now. (laughs) Really, truly come full circle, Um, which I'm 28, not, not very old. Uh, Certainly, (laughs) certainly not in the grand scheme of things, but I mean, even in swimming, you know, it's like you see more and more, it's becoming more common for sure. Uh, But as a 14 year old, it sounds like a, you know, you're just a kid, you're enjoying things. B, it sounds like you got a very Australian uh, perspective, which every Australian I've met is just like so chill. They're so relaxed. They're like, yeah, I'll, I'll, like you said, I'll give it a go. Um, and yeah. So, <laughs> so you make the team, the 2007 Worlds team, it, it, and it's a home world championships. I mean, did, yeah. did, did that kind of switch things? Like, I mean, did you feel pressure heading into that meet? No, I, I honestly, I think like the pressure thing didn't come to me maybe until I was like in my twenties. Like I feel like um, maybe, maybe before London, that whole pressure thing came in. But before that, I was just kind of like went to every meet and I was just kind of like, Oh, just, I'll just do it. Like, I don't like, it doesn't matter. And like, I mean, it didn't even hit me. Yeah. Like I think at that world's, I think I won the semis, I think, and like was going in first fastest into the final. And I was at this stage, I'm 14 and I'm still wearing togs. Like I was just wearing fast skin togs. And that was when people were wearing like legs. I was just in togs. 
Like it was just kind of crazy. Like I just didn't, like, it's not that I didn't care. It's just that I was like 14. Like I was just like happy to be on TV. It's <laughs> doing your thing. <laughs> just happy to be on TV. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> and you still won a gold medal at that meet, right? In the relay. Yeah. Um, yeah, the relay, I think we, I don't know if we broke the world record, we might have, um, but we definitely won the gold. And I was, yeah, I mean, being on the podium and you have Liesl Jones, Jessica Shipper and Libby Trickett, I just, I was like, kind of like, oh, whatever I do doesn't really matter. Like, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> Um, you did break the world record. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. You broke the world record and you have your lead off saying, nah, it's, it's all right. That's, yeah, I mean, that's a good supporting cast for sure. But also pretty yeah. funny that you were able to <laughs> keep such a, such a calm head. Um, <laughs> so, so as, as you move through that career, you know, you said, <clears throat> you said pressure didn't, you know, maybe started before 2012 Olympics. Um, and so, so I have to wonder what was, what was the first Olympics? Like, you know, you go in 2008. Um, and I mean, what did, what's your perspective on that experience? Yeah. Um, 2008 was really interesting. Obviously I hadn't really traveled much internationally before I was only six like freshly 16. Um, I mean, my, like the biggest thing that was so exciting to me was that there was a Macca's in the dining hall um, and I got to eat that for free. Um, but I think like, obviously I got nervous and, um, but I didn't really understand uh, like, I guess the pressure of an Olympics because I was so young. I just like was really blase about it. And uh was kind of like, oh, whatever, like it's just swimming, like it's just a swimming event. But, um, yeah, like, I mean, I lost a little bit of weight going into Beijing um, just because, like, obviously I was very used to foods that I was eating in Australia and then um, obviously mum made all my meals for me because I was living at home um, so she could really look out for me. And then I guess when you go on a team, you kind of then start looking at what other people are eating and then you're like, oh, well, I should eat the same sort of thing. So I dropped a bit of weight going into the Olympics. So I probably wasn't at um, like my top form that I was normally at. Um, but, I mean, I swam really well. Obviously I missed the final in the 100 back I think I was like nine so I just missed that final which was like a little bit disappointing but like because I was so young I didn't really uh, um obviously the four by one medley relay and then I swam I think like uh, the third fastest time or or whatever um so then I don't know like I was just stoked that I did it in that that team event that I felt like I had really proved my spot um, but there was like this really, um, it's probably not a funny story, but now that I relook at it, 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 it was fun. It's funny now, maybe like maybe the, um, I had an incident that I did something because I'm so blase, um, before that relay that then, um, made them question my spot on that relay. So it was it, like, it was an interesting night before that relay because I actually didn't know if I was going to be put into that relay until that morning mm -hmm. so it was it was it was intense what happened <laughs> um so in Beijing because the village was really big um everyone was buying these bikes to ride to the dining hall to ride around the village so they were like kind of saving their legs a little bit more um and as a 16 year old, I was like, Oh my God, this is awesome. Like I want one of these bikes. And I think it, it was like the, the afternoon before the relay. So I must have have, have swum in the morning and then just like rested for the rest of the day. And girls in my apartment were going out. Um, were like, they were running in and I was like, Oh, where are you guys going? And they were like, Oh, we're going to go buy bikes. There's a guy, a guy would come to like one of the village gates 
with like a van of bicycles and you could just buy them from him and he'd just give you one. So I was like, oh my God, I'm coming. Like I want a bike too. Obviously I hadn't finished swimming, but everyone else had. So we were like running out of our apartment, running to the gate. And the, we get there and the guy's like, oh, I've run out of bikes. He was like, but I can take you to my shop. And then we can, like, you can just pick out a bike from the shop. And like me, I was just like, oh, yeah, sure. Like, yeah, I'll go to the shop. And like, I'm 16 with a bunch of, like, there was maybe like, there was maybe like four or five of us or six of us. There was a few of us. So I felt like, oh, it's okay. Like, I'm going with other people. I'm not going by myself. Um, and then we go to his shop. We're there for ages. Like it just took forever to get these bikes. One of the bikes, uh, one of the basketball Australian boys, he wanted to buy a moped. I was like, that's ridiculous, mate. Like, why are you buying a moped? Like, what are you going to do with it when you go home? He's like, I'm going to leave it here. I was like, oh, classic basketballer. <laughs> just like has so much money, just can buy a moped. Anyway, we get these bikes. We've been there for ages. I keep getting these calls on my Chinese phone, but obviously I didn't have, like it was all Chinese numbers. So I was like, I had a feeling like it was my parents or my coach, but I knew I'd get into trouble. So I didn't want to answer the phone, of course. Mm. So then um, the guy's like, oh, I can't drop you back. Like you're going to have to ride your bikes. And I'm like to everyone, I'm freaking. At this stage, I'm freaking out. I was like, I can't ride my bike back. Like I'm supposed to swim the relay tomorrow. I can't ride the bike back to the village. I was like, this guy is going to have to drop us. Anyway, it took a bit of convincing, but we got the guy to drop us back. But he couldn't drop us as far as he came in before. I don't know why. So then we had to ride the bikes the rest of the way. It was probably like maybe like 200 meters. It wasn't far. Okay. I'm, I'm riding my bike and at the gate of the village, I can see my coach at the time, which is Matt Brown. His arms are folded. He's standing by the gate and I get, I like I ride my bike up. I like get off my bike and he was like, he said like, get off the effing bike now. He's like, you're in so much trouble. And I was like, oh, no. Like, I was like, oh, no. And he's like, everyone knows you left. Alan Thompson, which was our head coach at the time, he knows you left. You have to go see him now because you have to talk to him as to why you should swim the relay tomorrow. And I was just like, oh, my God, I'm 16. I'm like, what am, what am I going to say to him? And I remember, like, I went straight there. Um, I went up to his room. He's kind of like, you know, what you did was really stupid. Like, we don't want to jeopardize this relay. This relay has to be really strong, um, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I mean, I, all I remember saying to him was like, I've got this. I can do it. Just let me swim it. And then he was like, all right, like, I'm going to have a think about this and I'll let you know tomorrow. And I'm there you know, like then me and Matt walk to dinner together. We've, we're having dinner and I'm saying to him, do you think I'll be swimming tomorrow? And he said, honestly, I don't know. And then he's like, but you gotta, you got to pretend that you are. you got to like go back to bed. you got to have a proper sleep, wake up thinking that you're doing it. And I did. And I think I got a text or he came and saw me that morning was like, you're in, you're doing it, but don't screw this up. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I swam that leg and I was like, yes, like I've done it. Like I'm safe. Like no one's going to be angry with me. And we got the medal and we did that victory lap. And I remember walking straight up to Alan Thompson and being like, I told you he could, I could do it. And he was like, don't ever do it again. And it was just like, I was, I kind of like laughed it off like, ha, huh, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that's what happened before that relay. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah, I'm, was- I'm like sweating over here. I like I knew you were on the relay, <laughs> but I was still like, was she on the relay? Oh my! Like I, that was that was a great story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. Yeah, it's uh, a crazy story. <laughs> no kidding, man. Okay, so just, just trying to get back on track. Um, so you, you, you know, obviously you have this, you have this blase attitude, like you said, which not a bad, th- I mean, I think it's a great thing. It's, it seems like it really aided you, um, throughout your younger years. 
what would you attribute that to? I mean, were your parents really relaxed about you swimming? Did you play other sports? Is it, is it, is it just the Australian mindset? I mean, what, what do you attribute this just kind of like very chill attitude to? Uh, I think like growing up swimming wasn't uh, like, honestly, when I was really, really young, I hated swimming. Um, I was the kid that would cry that would hide, that would um, scream. Um, and my mom teaches learn to swim. So when she was working, we were obviously doing a lesson. And I'd be the kid crying and the teacher would be like, is she okay? Like, do I need to like let her sit out? And mum would be like, no, just keep her in. She's fine. She can swim. And it wasn't that I didn't enjoy swimming. It's just I didn't like like doing like lessons, I just enjoyed, you know, duck diving. Like me and my brother, me and my brothers are really close in age. And my oldest brother is four years older than me. And then the next is two years older. And we were always in the same class. And when I got a bit older and we were doing um, like 50 meter swimming when we were a bit older, we would go under the water, we would duck dive under the water and both punch each other and then swim back up. And we'd always get into trouble for doing it. But it was just that we had fun in the water. It's just, I didn't really like, didn't really understand the point of just like swimming continue, continuous laps. Like I didn't really enjoy that side of it, but uh, I definitely enjoyed racing. Um, that was kind of where I had a love for swimming. I loved racing and I loved competing and I Honestly, I loved winning. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> um, so, so you know, your younger years, you you become an established member of the Australian national team with this blasé attitude. Do you feel like you had a reputation during your formative years on the Australian national team? Like, what do you think your teammates thought of you when you were that 16, 17, 18 year old kid? Honestly, they probably thought I was that annoying kid in the beginning that um, because I was just kind of like, didn't really like, I just kind of did whatever and then got out and didn't really understand kind of the magnitude of what I'd done at times. Um, and I still, sometimes I still don't understand um, how good my times are. Uh, like I just got my um, race analysis back from uh, ISL and it's been compared to obviously like the best times that I've done before. And my swimming speed is better than what I was doing when I was going, when I did my 159 or my 55. So it's like I did like sometimes I don't understand that. Like I, I don't see the magnitude of how good that is. Um, and as I've got older, I understand there's some things that I do that are really amazing um, and mind blowing, but I'm really, I'm one of those people that's just like really hard on themselves. Like I find it hard to take little wins away if I think that I could have done better. Um, and I think like people probably would have thought at the start, like, oh, this kid, like she's not serious. Like she, she kind of just does what she wants. And that was just like the way that I did things and, and how I got to where I was. But I think now that I've gotten older, I can see what I'm doing and I, and I always want to do better. Whereas when I was younger, I kind of just did whatever and it didn't really matter because I was having fun and I was enjoying it. And then at some point it kind of turned from being, oh, this is just for fun as this being my full-time job. Yeah. And so, so that's a, that's a great transition point um, into, you know, it, like you said, you started feeling pressure at some point um, and, and this becomes a full-time job at some point. And so how, Tell me about that transition and how you ended up being able to deal with it being a full-time job, there being pressure associated with it. Yeah, I think um, sometimes I do better than others with pressure. Um, and sometimes I know that I'm not at my best and that's kind of hard. Like I think leading into 2019, I was struggling a lot. 
Um, uh, I mean, it's hard to say, like, because I was dealing with a lot emotionally. Obviously, I had a really bad uh, 2018 as well. Like, in my personal life, things were going on. And then um, I was getting a lot of pressure um, from where I was to be a skinnier version of myself, a more lean version of myself. And I've never been one of those kids, like when I was younger, I never had to, like I never were really worried about um, my weight or what I looked like. And I think, you know, as a woman, you get to an age where you realise you can't eat what you did when you were younger. And then I think it, it takes a toll on you when you have, people in your close environment that you bring in that then tell you something different about yourself. And that took me a really long time to kind of uh, get over that and um, kind of be happy with how I am now. And like, still like it's an everyday struggle, obviously, like it's hard when you're a swimmer and you have to be in like the smallest work wherever all the time and like I obviously feel a lot of pressure from like it's hard with social media like you're seeing like a lot of different shapes of girls but really like one shape is kind of like a lot of what you see um and then like being an athlete like you obviously have to look different like you can't look like a normal person almost and yeah that was really hard and I think that's made it it was like a really hard year for me last year trying to deal with that and then coming into this year it's just kind of about finding the confidence in myself and obviously with my racing and like going to ISL was really important because that gave me a chance to see what my racing is like in that international experience and to be able to get that confidence back that it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm one or two kilos heavier than where I was two years ago, or where I was when I was 16, like that's like, it's always going to be different, but that wasn't a factor in whether I could swim good or not. And I think it took me a really long time to realize that it's not a factor in whether I can swim good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So again, just, just processing. I mean, that's, that's a lot of, um, reality and I think you hit it, you hit it perfectly. Um, did, I mean, did this, did you find this affecting you, um, how you were training? Like, did, did the mental strain of this affect how you were able to compete, how you were able to train, um, for, I don't know, months at a time for years at a time, or was this more, was this an isolated period or was this more of like a, 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 a long process? Um, yeah, well, this was basically from like the end of 2018 all the way through 2019 and kind of like, it's obviously still there in my mind. And some days I'm better at saying like, Oh, don't worry about it than others. Um, but there were like, uh, I was, over exercising to the extreme um there were like sessions where obviously in the morning I'd do gym I'd do swim then I'd go and do my own gym again somewhere else I would swim in the afternoon and then I would do it like something else like at one stage I joined like a netball squad and I was um doing that after training and then for dinner I'd have a glass of milk um Like it like went to the absolute extreme and like I was disappointed in myself that I let it get to that before I actually went out and seeked help. Um, So that was like a really hard period for me. And like, obviously like it takes a long time to recover from that, but that I think didn't help me leading into um, 2019 and trying to make that team. I just knew that I knew personally deep down that I wasn't going to make that team. Like I knew it before I got there. I knew that I'd still been training well, but I hadn't. Like I knew that for me, I always feel like it's the year before that gives you that prep for that year. Um, So I knew that my prep in 2018 wasn't going to get me to where I needed to be 2019. And I kind of knew that 2019 was going to be a really tough year, but 
you know, I turned it around and um, I found a program that I loved and, you know, I'm starting to feel more confident in myself. So, I mean, heading into a trials meet where, like you said, deep down, you know, you're not going to make it. And I mean, I guess there's always a chance, but you know, if you have, if, if you have that feeling, it's certainly hard to shake. How do you, how do you not just like crumple, right? Like, how do you not just like, what's the, why even here, you know, like why even go, how, how do you get through that? How do you deal with that? How do you keep moving forward? Uh, yeah, well, I guess I feel like I needed to go um, to, to just like give myself a realization that I'm doing this for more than just making a team. Like I'm doing this because I do love it, that deep down I do love it, that I do enjoy that racing um, and that I wanted to get better. And I think that I didn't realize how much I needed a change until I got there and I was like, yeah, okay, like it's pretty obvious now, like I need a change, like I can't keep doing the same thing. And, and it's a great answer. <laughs> Um, okay. So it's shifting gears just a little bit to what we talked about at the, at the very beginning of the podcast, you know, um, I introduced you with, with all these accolades, you've won all these gold medals and all these international medals. And I think as a member of the media, it is super easy for me for, for the media to get caught up in, oh, well, they won this medal at this meet, or they won this medal at this meet, the medals, right? I mean, it's like, that's things we make up. That's things we like, I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time describing it, but it's, it's swimming is much more than medals. Um, and as it, it took me years of talking to elite athletes such as yourself to kind of re wrap my head around that. Like they probably don't really care about the medals as much as like I do, or as much as someone else does. Um, and like you were saying, you know, as much as going a best time or, or trying to be your best on that day. And I, this might be a big question, but kind of throughout your career, maybe just in the last couple of years, how, how, how do you balance that of like, you know, going for making a world's team or making an Olympic team or trying to get a medal versus just trying, to, you know, versus, versus what goal you, what personal goal you might have. Yeah, I think uh, as I've uh, as I've like been there, I've done that. I've been to three Olympics. I've you know been to numerous worlds. I've been to uh, three comp games now. Like it, like I've been there. I've done it. Like I, I've gotten the medals. Like now it's you know my chance to just improve myself and to be a better person and to be a better swimmer for me and not for getting a medal and trying to win. And yeah, like that's the goal. Obviously, I do want to win because I have that competitive nature that I want to win. But, you know, I want to beat myself. That's so simple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And I mean, did did you go through a period where the goal where outside goals were overshadowing your personal goals or do you feel like you've been able to keep those personal goals at the forefront um pretty consistently uh yeah like i think uh, at some points in my career i've had um like outside uh people uh that have made me try and lose my focus um i had a time where i had people saying like oh to me like how much is it to win a gold medal here or like how much do you want to be the best swimmer in Australia like or how much do you want to be famous and stuff like that and it's like sometimes you get distracted with the goal because people will say that to you and you think oh yeah like I do want that like I do like that um but then like I think as you get older and you mature and like, obviously I've been through like some really personal struggles as of late and still struggle with that. So I think now it, it's more about proving to myself that I'm still a great swimmer and it doesn't matter if I don't win. Like 
as much as that's hard to take at times, like being met in the moment, of course I want to win every single time I get in the pool, but I also want to be the best swimmer that I can be and get down. Like it's hard because I think I was talking to my boyfriend about ISL and I was like, oh, I really, you know, it's I, it would be nice to go my best times again. Like I, I haven't gone best times in a really long time, but he was like, yeah, but you're chipping away. Like it, you're, you're taking that time lower and lower each time you swim. And I was like, yeah, but it's not happening, happening fast enough. Like, why isn't it changing faster? And he was like, but you're working. Like you, you're, you're trying to do something different. Like you're trying to be a different swimmer. Like you're not that same swimmer that you were. And like, sometimes like it just clicks like that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah shit, I'm not, I'm not 16 anymore. Like I can't just like get in the pool every single time and swim a PB, but I can still get in the pool and still be a great swimmer. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, and that's great, great, great transition, great coming full circle. So you're in this new program. Um, and you're, you know, you're adapting to it and you had this positive ISL experience. What are you excited about just moving forward into these next couple weeks, couple months, um, of, of getting to learn and experiment and, you know, work with this new program that you're in? Yeah, well, um, I think it's almost been a year now that I've been in, or just, uh, no, over a year that I've been in the program with Bowl on the Coast and, it's like, it's hard work. It is hard, but I love working hard. Um, I don't see the point in working easy. I just get bored of that. Um, I do just love to push myself as much as I can. And Bowley has a thing like when we swim really well in a session, he'll call it um, WC, like world champion, like world-class, like that was world-class. Like what you did tonight was world-class. So I really like that and I really like pushing for that. And even when he says, oh, that's world cast, like I'm very like, yeah, it was all right. Like it wasn't great, but it was all right. Like because I always just feel like I can do better. Like I know I can do better and I love just pushing myself and I love having him there because he's really, he's super positive and he's super, um, he understands what it's like being there for so long and so still trying to get better and um like when I first met with him and said oh like I want to train with you he was like okay well I only want someone who seriously wants to go to the Olympics and swim well he said I just don't want you to come and you just be like oh I just want to make my fourth Olympics and be like oh I've been to four Olympics like he really wanted me to do like it for me like to do it full and I was like yep yeah, I'm in like I'm doing it like I'm gonna go for it like I really want to do that and I feel like when I swim I'm doing it for him too because like I want to prove to him that I want it and um yeah I just like I love the squad it's it's fun it's full of people that have been on the team for a while like there's obviously Tom Fraser Holmes I train with Emma McKeon, Dave McKeon, um, obviously Georgia Bowl swims with us. And then we have a, coll- a girl that went to college, Jessica Unicom. Like it's a great squad to train with. And I have so much fun. And like Taylor McEwen's there as well. Like it's just like a bit of a laugh too. And like it's an older squad. And I feel like we can just like really connect with each other. And like I feel like it's fun to go there and have a chat and then you know, train hard and kind of like, we kind of just banter with each other and have fun. <laughs> I'm just picturing you being, it was world-class minus. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't quite <laughs> I know. I'm just one of those. <laughs> I can't help myself. I'm, I'm he's like, like one day he said to me, like, get more excited about it. And I was like, woo. <laughs> And he just laughs at me. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about the program. What is it? Is it really different than something than than what you had been used to? Is it higher, higher meters, lower meters, more like intensity? 
Um, what have you enjoyed about it? Uh, it's probably very, like it's, it's similar to what I was doing when I was younger with Matt Brown. Um, very, very much like that. Maybe less Ks than what I was doing. Like we do about 5K a session. Um, we don't really go too much more than that. Uh, some, of, some of the other guys go a bit more. Like obviously Tommy goes a bit more because he does longer events than I do. Um, but, yeah, no, the intensity, like we have a hard session Tuesday afternoon. Well, Monday afternoon I, I say is hard, but Bowley would probably not say it's that hard. Uh, so Monday, Tuesday afternoon, hard. Thursday afternoon, hard. Usually maybe like a suited effort. Um, on Thursday night so that's pretty hard and then Saturday morning's hard Um, but like all the sessions are that like some of them are like really hard that I'm like lying on the side of the pool like shit like I can't move after that I'll go home and be like I can't cook dinner like my arms or something but (laughs) like I always feel good even though it's like so hard I can't move I'm like shit yeah like I feel good about it (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like a good fit, man. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I, I feel like I had one last topic to bring up. We we talked about the training, but I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we I, we've been talking for an hour. Uh, I think that's, I think we're at a good stopping point. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time, Emily. Do you have any parting thoughts before we sign off? Uh, no, you've honestly just killed an hour of my quarantine that I won't have to ride a bike because I just get so bored in here. So thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.